Jay here for Stratford Paddock. That's Stephen Alston. This is The Brew. Um, usually, obviously, and we will get into all the subjects a little bit later on, like David Beckham, but I'm going to start off on a bit of a sad note because the news just broke about an hour ago, I think it was, that um, Lady Cathy Ferguson has passed away. Um, we've seen a, a statement. Uh, there's lots of statements floating around. There's one here I've just got from the club. It says, everyone at Manchester United sends our heartfelt condolences to Sir Alex Ferguson and his family on the passing of Lady Cathy. Lady Cathy was a beloved wife, mother, sister, grandmother and great-grandmother and a tower of strength for, for Sir Alex Sorry, throughout his career. I mean, I was there when um, his statue was unveiled and she unveiled his statue because he said she deserves this as much as I do as big a part of my success as anyone and it was only fitting that she unveiled it and obviously this is sad news for Sir Alex and his family and for, for everyone associated with the club because she's a big part of Manchester United yeah mate she did um, she probably did a hell of a lot more for the club than a lot of people have done than a lot of people who've got winners medals and stuff yeah. I, I think her contribution you know and, and how she supported Sir Alex uh, and especially if you read his books the uh the sort of strength he gets from his wife absolutely resonates through all of those. Yeah. Um, and even when he references his retirement, uh, she needs me now, so yeah, that's what we're going to do. Because there's, it's funny you mention that, because I've got someone quote, I think Darren Richmond quote, um, I don't know, quoted one of his books earlier. And basically, long story short of, was he was going to retire around 2002. And Cathy said, you're not. We've decided, me and the kids have decided, you're not retiring. And obviously he stayed on from 2002 to 2013, won a load more titles, won another Champions League. And Cathy was a big part of that, in, in, encouraging him to go back to work, basically. And then in 2013, he, he decided right now's the time to, to spend more time with her and, and the rest of his, his family, obviously. So, you know, like you say, just a, a massive part of, of Sir Alex. And you can tell that from him, because how close to where he was referenced, he was mentioned uh, he's a family type of guy. Oh, Champions League final 99, as soon as the game ends, what's he doing? He's looking up for where yeah. she is, isn't he? And he, yeah. he talks about it in the documentary as well. And yeah, sad times, sad times for all the Ferguson family, obviously. Um, sad times for Sir Alex, um, you know, a man that's recently gone through a brain hemorrhage, um, appears to have fully recovered from it. But yeah, like, uh, you know, what a, you know, just a mad situation it is for him going forward, you know. 59 uh, years I think they were married for, which is just phenomenal and obviously that's a, and, and, and a 59 marriage that, years of being. that came about with a lot of bigotry around it as well at the time. This is the Protestant, Protestant and, and, and Catholic. And the, the, the yeah, Cathy is a Catholic. Right. And, so and that's right, Protestant, played for Rangers. <laughs> and um, I think this is a great moment in his documentary actually, it talks about that when he's, he's dead, I think, was it a board member or a director from Rangers was like, so your wife, Catholic. And he's like, I should have told my fuck off. Yeah, 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 it's true. But that was obviously a big deal at the time and wasn't going to put either of them off, wasn't going to stop him. They both got married and spent 59 years together. And let's, let's be honest with you, when you're that close to someone, you can't have success, you can't win, you can't do what you need to do. You can't even take a job if they're not supportive. You can't. You can't, you can't do it. And obviously she went down, moved with him. She said it, I think, in that same documentary, one of the documentaries. It was a wrench for her to live in Aberdeen. They'd, they'd met, set up a home, home there. He was successful. The kids were happy. They were having children, or they'd had children, sorry. Um, and then it's like we're moving to Manchester, which is obviously you know, hundreds of miles away and you're leaving all your friends and your family. But she was willing to do that because she knew how important it was to him. And because of that decision, obviously the rest is history. I'll go through some of the, the comments uh, just before we move on. Um, just lots of people saying R.I.P. Uh, Ross Murphy says, Lady Cathy was the rock to Sir Alex. Um, Amaya Kakali says, R.I.P. Lady Cathy. Um, Acon Electron, R.I.P. Cathy. Like she came across as funny, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of the stuff that you see in documentaries, like she definitely kept Fergie's feet on the ground. Because yeah. I reckon Fergie, he's a gambler in that one, this. So yeah, he probably, yeah. and he's got an ego. Yeah. He's probably fucking thinks he's cock of the walk sometimes. I bet she brought him down to earth hard plenty of times and you need that you need a bit of that don't you and, and like obviously you know he's got to work and he's doing what he's doing and he's coming home and he's like, not look at when he got his knighthood don't you think he's won enough <laughs> 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 what a line oh, do you think your husband will take a knighthood uh, yeah. don't you think he's won enough I love that you need a bit of that <laughs> do you know what I mean you need keeping on your feet on the ground obviously when you you're going into work and everyone's telling how amazing you are and you wouldn't have all this success you need someone who can keep you grounded and they were obviously a, a massive partnership and our thoughts as I've said go uh, out to Sir Alex, to his family, and to uh, the friends as well. And you know, sad, sad news this afternoon. Um, I want to talk. We we'll move on. Talk about 
your one of your favourite subjects. Well, we did this yesterday, you know. Just because you watched it last night. Yeah. And well, that's why you want to join in now. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. No. I, don't, I, didn't, I know you're not going to go. I don't know why I asked that. Cause I know you're gonna go, no, we've spoke about David Beckham once this week. I'm not doing it again. But we did, me and you, Macker off the bar, spoke about. I it. can't believe you didn't spend all day watching it Wednesday. No, oh, mate, I flopped, right? Because I, 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 what did I do? I had, I had a few things going on. I had parents' evening. Uh, so I, what? I know, I know, I know. Just, There's no just let them finish school and we'll assess how they did then. Uh, the, you know, it's. <laughs> Are they in jail? No. Have they been named? No. Right, fine. Yeah, That's all I need. To... Yeah, that, great. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I didn't really have a chance, and I, I watched it last night. We only got two episodes in, so I've not even watched it all yet. So I'm going to watch three and four. So I got to the end of episode two, beginning of episode three. So basically, things have started going a bit Pete Song at United, and it's like, it looks like he's heading to Madrid. That's where I'm up to. But one thing that just was instilled in me last night when I was watching it again was just how angry I was getting with Glenn Hoddle, what he did to him, the press and rival fans and also the how paparazzi come out of it real yeah, fast. Yeah, like them two were but it's like the interview at Hotel uh, Football. Yeah, but were you surprised the interview at Hotel Football? I was. No, I wasn't I, surprised. I thought, where else are you going to interview him? I know but I thought like because Gary Neville was like sort of mentioned him, didn't he? When those two brothers were, uh, and then he, next might, he might not know. <laughs> so, that was weird. It was like weird the way it was edited because them two brothers. Here's how it might have gone down. We're gonna do some filming for the Beckham documentary. Do you mind if we do it in old football? Oh no, crap. Yeah, 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 yeah. Meanwhile, yeah, get them two paparazzi down. <laughs> yeah, and he watches. He's like, "What are they doing in there?" Because he was slagging him off, and then they were just sat in old football. But even though it was 20 years ago, it feels like a completely different world. It was a different world. Like, what was going on? Look at all the shit Piers Morgan did. And I don't forget, by the way. You like, don't forget, I like that about you. I the, like that about you. The, um, yeah, the, the, way, the way all of the tabloids treated Manchester United, and specifically Beckham, around that time was awful. Mm. And it shouldn't be forgotten. No. And that's why I have a beam of, some people might say, oh, why are you rising to debate with this or that? Because some people's got to let them know. Because no one was around to let them know in 98. Like, fuck you. We had fanzines, great fanzines from back in the day. I remember reading a, a big, probably, no one had admitted him, had probably 16 pages special on Beckham and the World Cup and this, that and the other. And the rallying cry is like, he's ours and we get behind him. And that was that from then. That was the law as far as I you, was concerned. You, you nailed it yesterday when we saw about this. You said you think Fergie reveled in it a little bit when it was like, us against the world and I'm going to protect my player. And I saw that when I was watching documentary, you can tell he did. It was like, don't worry, son. You know, we've got you. He had a lot of incidences to deal with as well, always with England. Yeah, he Which did. is why a lot of United fans just go, oh, fuck national team. I get that as well. And watching that, it did put me off. What I loved as well was like, Keno was in it, and he's sort of talking about how, you know, we stuck together and we had his back. And you've seen some of the challenges he was getting and the abuse he was getting, and then you just see People like, forget me. Like, that that's him shield on where he just basically elbows him in the face. And then Keno's right on it, right on him. Andy Sinton as well, like a knee high, like studs up challenge. But, but all of the opposition fans was buzzing off it. Yeah, it's obviously playing to the crowd, isn't it? Because yeah, yeah, you know you're going to get done for that. You're not going to get away with it. And they were doing it because it's like, oh, my yeah, fans are loving it. even get yellows. Oh, mate, it's so crazy. And, like, and Keno, I think Keno got more in trouble for his reaction to some of them. But it was mad that that all went on. But the thing I will never get on, and we've spoke about this on this podcast loads of times, we've even put it on the screen before, is the whole dartboard hammering thing, like a dartboard with his face But on. it all did start from Glenn Hoddle. Because if, if Glenn Hoddle's interview, Glenn Hoddle's, I'm trying to be sympathetic to Glenn Hoddle. Because you've met Glenn Hoddle, haven't you? And you got on with him, didn't you? Isn't, I get on like with him in terms of like, I want to know everything he's got to say about football. Yeah. There's some aspects of his personality I don't want to talk to him. And about. also, this is 20 years on. He's at, right then, he's in his 30s or 40s, I think. He's very young, isn't he? Yeah, man? he's a young manager and I know he's England boss, but he's like very, he might even be late 30s, so he's only, he's not long retired. Different attitude, hasn't got the experience, managed Chelsea and Swindon for a few years, thrown into the England job, and, and does a lot of playing to the crowd, doesn't he, Glenn Hoddle, in, during that time? I remember him. Don't remember that too much. I remember like, him getting off the plane, I'll never forget him going like that. And then, when, when they go to the World Cup in, um, in France, Beckham's played every single qualifying game and played well. Played really well for his country. And they get to that first game against Tunisia, and he drops him. And not only does he drop him, he questions him before the game about his attitude. So, mm, I don't know if his head's in where his head's at. And let's not forget, right, in the 90s, you, was, you were coming out of it slightly, but it was still there of players, there were players who would go out and get levered. Like the, the thingy chair was only nine, Euro 96, which was two years earlier. Players going out and getting absolutely kiboshed 
when they weren't playing football. His vice was go to see his fiance, like maybe driving a bit further than he should have done before a game or whatever. He wasn't like bang on yeah, the Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that yesterday. You know, I think there was times when he was sacrificing his sleep, it felt like, to go and see her. Yeah. But I also think that, I mean, by the looks of it, they're very fucking strong and close together as well in terms of like, they're proper having each other. Yeah. And I think that some of the shit that he got, he dealt with because of Victoria. Yeah, 100%. And, and I think like, she, I think she came out of the documentary quite well in all honesty, because I think everything that I'd ever thought about her was probably led by fanzines and the media. Mm. I don't know her, I don't know mm. her. No. I've got no first-hand experience of her. So you, you think, I questioned my own prejudices of what I'd heard about Victoria Beckham. And I said to you earlier, innit? Like we, uh, it, it was always the sort of impression that she made all the decisions and she was the one yeah. in the driving seat and she wanted to go here and she wanted to go there. But actually, if you watch the documentary, so much of it was like, she's finding out as it's on the news, Beckham's decided that he's gonna go to Milan and Paris and this, that and the other. She's like, we're doing what? And you're like, that's not, like, so there's so many misconceptions about them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I thought it was a genuinely top documentary. It's in the pantheon of The Last Dance for me. Really? Because yeah. so far I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I think what I like about it as well, they've had budget. Like, do you know what I mean? Do you think David Beckham's doing anything with a fucking... That's what I mean, but you, I, know, I know with Beckham, you're right. But we've seen some documentaries, haven't we, where I think me and you spoke about the Robson one. Now, Brian Robson, one of the greatest players of all time. Documentary doesn't do justice. No, it doesn't. Neither does Wayne Rooney. No. That felt like someone would, That felt like someone pitched an idea during COVID. COVID documentary. Nailed it, bro. Uh, and there was like, let's just shoot someone. Do you remember we were churning him out during 20? Because it was like, right, we need content. That's exactly what like, I think. Well, let's get archive footage because you've seen it with like good documentaries like Senna, um, Amy. I know it's all the same, same director where you, you've got, got access to archive, you can make a good documentary. The trouble is, if you've just got access to archive and a few interviews, you can also make a bad documentary. And we yeah, saw Rob some Owens bad was ones. was very underwhelming. It was. For, for, and it's a shame, really, because the generation of fans, I just caught Robbo. Like yeah, he's the generation yeah. before my lot really. Yeah. So I think for the people that came after I did and like Ronaldo and that, people that was born yeah. late nineties or even in the 2000s, they were a fucking clue about Robbo. And you ain't gonna no. do that documentary. There was so much in that Robbo documentary where they just sort of almost brushed it aside. It was like, oh yeah, the FA Cup semi-final replay where he scores one of the greatest goals of all time against Liverpool. I think it's with his left foot. Basically to sort of that explain Robbo, Imagine having a conversation now about Steven Gerrard with die-hard Liverpool fans. Yeah. Right? That was Robbo. Yeah, it was. Because and the strength of feeling, like, and you can argue whether they're right or wrong, and they're wrong, but you can understand the weight of feeling behind them in their heads and in United fans from the 80s heads. Robbo was the best player in the world and shut your mouth. Yeah. That's it. And that's it. And also, there's kind of like, I mean, there's evidence to support it for starters in some of the performances and the performances against top players like Diego Maradona at Barcelona, for example. And the fact that during that period, you know, like, we're at United, my mouth we, we've grown up, <laughs> up until recently, of seeing midfielders and players playing alongside other great players. And sometimes you'll get a midfielder who is just good, like cleverly. I know he gets a lot of stick. He's all right, but he's got a winner's medal. Fine, yeah, looks yeah, fine in that team. Because he's uh, surrounded by enough world-class players to, to be part of the best team in the, in the country. Yeah, Robbo, meanwhile, alongside Graham Hogg. Exactly, and he makes him look Peter men. Davenport. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Said he gives him a line, like, more. what's going on here? Do you know what I mean? Like, Robbo's in a team full of, at one point, I know there's always, you know, you Paul McGrath and you know my That's the thing side. is, the 80s has got that weird thing where there is a... There is a spine of a fucking genuinely world-class yeah. team. But that team was either too drunk yeah. or too injured. Or both. Or both, yeah. To actually turn out. Like, imagine Whiteside and Hughes together up front. I know Whiteside flitted between striking no, and midfield. No, like, knowledge so, is on point. So, all right, Stapleton and Hughes. Like, yeah. Whiteside and Robbo was a midfield partnership. And then you've got McGrath, you've got Remy Moses. You know, Who's class. You've got the spine of a fucking serious football team, yeah. but they didn't play like a serious football well, team. Well, it's funny, isn't it, because... And they also loved, like, they were a serious yeah. football team, but they weren't a serious football well, team. Well, if you've seen the documentary, I think, I don't know if it's the Robbo one. There's one where it talks about Atkinson and his, um, his attitude towards the, the matches. 
and Gordon Strachan's doing an interview and he says, right, so we, he said, get ready. And he goes, the manager will get you all in the room, right, before the he game. He won trophies. He did, he won. But he's telling it, he won tournaments rather than the league. But he came third a couple of times yeah, as well. But, you can't do that. No, it's true. But if you notice with those ones, it tends to be a mad run like we'll win 10 out of the first, well, the first 10 we games. We should have the league and came third. Yeah, than and then we'll fall third. off because people are getting drunk, people are getting injured, we haven't got a squad, the managers, they love big money signings, not strengthening the academy or whatever. I know we had Hughes and, and Whiteside coming through, but he says like the team talk could be him opening his suitcase or his briefcase, putting out his hairspray, doing his hair, putting on some aftershave and just going, right, go out there and you know, you're playing Liverpool today or Everton or whatever, go out there and just batter them. And you're like, but, but what about what about the opposition, Gaffer? Don't worry about them. Just play your game. You'll be right. Do I look like I give up <laughs> about the opposition? <laughs> Big Ron would be a good documentary, you know, That's... because there's there's multiple sides of Big Ron, and there's good and bad you, with Big right. Ron. Would you interview Big Ron? No, and I had the opportunity to. And I know that you know this. I know, but I didn't. And that's why I worded it like that rather than throw it, because I had the opportunity to do something with Ron, um, a, a live event, and I said. No. People are lesser morals will probably do it, okay? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, but I felt, for me personally, and I, listen, I'm a big believer in forgiveness and all that. And if you don't understand what we're talking about, Google Big Ron. And mass, if you really don't get it, then just put Marcel Desai in the Google search as well. But for me, especially with my stance on racism and other stuff as well, I thought it'd be a bit hypocritical to stand on the stage and share jokes with a guy. And it's not an interview where I'm going to go, so tell me about what you said about Desai. And also, I know he's addressed it. Yeah. But if you brought him on any of our platforms, I would have to readdress it. Of course you would. And he doesn't want to readdress it. No. Which I can, I can also sort of understand, because yeah, like, I have addressed it. And it's been like 50, 20 years since he's addressed it. So he, from his point of view, he's like, look, I've done all this, I'm what, he's 80 odd or whatever now. I don't want to keep going over it. From our point of view, it's like, well, this is a big deal to us because we probably know more about this than we do about your career at United, because we were only like, I was seven when he got sat, so you must have been even younger. Yeah, oh no, six, sorry, when he got sat. So, you know, Three. we. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we want to talk about it. He obviously doesn't, which is one of the reasons I was like, I'm not going to go and do a live event with him where it's like, oh, tell us about signing Robertson and, oh, but what you said about Dice, because it wouldn't have been that kind of thing. And if you got him on here or got him on your channel or wherever, then you'd want to talk about that. And he, I he, think a documentary would be a good way to do it, though. Because I you think have it to would. address that. And, but you also have to address every other aspect He's of it. He's so disappointed as well, because Training he meant, was five aside <laughs> exclusively. And have you seen the way they split the teams? Yes. Yes. I know you have again. That's another story. Which... By the way, I don't know what you're going to Google, but Google that. Yeah, Google that. <laughs> the maddest thing for that was Paul McGrath defending that. Um, but yeah. So like you have shirts versus skins. Yeah. Well, he did skins versus skins. You figure out how they, yeah, they separate. Yeah, and, and you also look at the words he used to, to decide those teams as well. Is unbelievable, and I don't mean that in a positive way. But you've got this guy who says these things that are abhorrent and obviously struggles with it a little bit in terms of thinking he's done anything wrong, then eventually comes around perhaps to thinking, okay, I've, I should have done it. But he's also one of the first managers who's going literally in the top division, saying, I am gonna have a lot of black players in my team. I am gonna have Silver Regis and Brendan Batson and um, Remy Moses. And other managers weren't doing that. They weren't doing it. You know, there's the famous story, well, not story, and it's nothing to be proud of. And the, when they came to Old Trafford, West Bromwich Albion and Battered United, and the, they were getting booed. The black players were getting booed, and yet he was one of those. That, that, that. doesn't compute to me. It doesn't me, because I always think of Old Trafford, no, it's not perfect, and I've seen racism at Old Trafford, but I always think of United as a club of being a multicultural, progressive club who you wouldn't think that's a racist club or that's a racist fan base. We're not that type no, of... No, stop, stop, stop. Sorry, no, no, Stoke or Millwall or somewhere like Burnley. Burnley, yeah, it's like, you know, we're well, not going to see an All live, all li Lives Matter banner flying over <laughs> Old Trafford anytime soon, certainly not from a United fan. But you've got all that from him where when it mattered in early doors, he was one of the, and I hate this word, forgive me, I'm going to use it, an ally. And then you fast forward to when everyone's sort of progressive and, and has that good, the right attitude and he's suddenly gone backwards and coming out of things that you just shouldn't say. It's weird. And in the middle of all that, let's not forget, you've got a crazy career as a manager. Like at one point, I think he was the only manager who'd won trophies. Could he have managed England? Yes. See, maybe that's yes. what the title of the documentary should be. That is a really good Big shout. Big one for England. That is a really good shout because... Because then you can... There's so many angles to throw in it and there. there's the attitude towards black players in a positive yeah. and negative. Like, he's a, such a dichotomy of a character. It is, isn't it? And it's weird because I think... I think that's very interesting. That's a really good it. question as well because I think it was Graham Taylor who said, like, he was getting a nudge about the amount of black players he was picking. And this was in the 90s. 
What as in like picked, questioned about it? Oh, you've got too many. Yeah, because like, he had Des Walker once. Yeah, and, and I think he gave Tony Daly a cap because he knew him from Villa. And they went, really? We've already, got, you've already he said in one of his books, and I need to get I need to get this right, but I know he said in one of his book that he wrote or one of his books that he was questioned about. I it. get questions similar at Paddock actually. <laughs> you've got the way around. Have you got any white lads in your team? What, bro? Like, you've been a bit like, <laughs> can white players play for you? Yeah. I can't do big runs where splitting the teams. <laughs> so it's going to be the entire squad against the. Uh, actually, just you play amongst yourselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's mad because apparently, you remember when this was like, I don't know, I don't know if it's still the same now, I don't think it is, where the manager would have to face the committee and do all that stuff. I don't know if you ever saw, have you ever seen the, the Graham Taylor documentary? No, but it's in the, uh, it's quite a few times in the Damned United where he has to sort of speak to the committee and stuff. Yeah, so you sit there and you go into the FA and you go explaining your decision, right, I pick, you know, Brian Robson and... Oh, uh, no, for in terms of selection committee? Yeah, oh, so wow. he, he, you'd go and you would explain your decisions. So you would sit there in the table... Oh, can I bring that back just for Gareth Southgate? Mint, please do. Can you go on that committee? Yeah, you? can I be on that committee? Well, yeah, that'd be great. I'll even put specs on. <laughs> I'll do that every now and then. Yeah, because that's why Brian Clough said he couldn't be England manager. He said when he went for the interview, he said they knew I would never ever put up with a committee telling me who I could pick or justify my actions. I wouldn't even tell him who was picking or why. Yeah, why are you picking him? Because, because I'm the fucking manager. How yeah. about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they knew that he weren't going to do it. He knew he weren't going to put up with it. The only way he was going to be England manager is if they went, we're just going to have to let him do his own thing. And they weren't prepared to do that, which is why like Ron Greenwood and even uh, Bobby Robson ended up as manager. So yeah, there was that element to it. Um, and that apparently when, is when Graham Taylor was getting some sort of questions about how many black players he was picking, which is just outrageous because this is the 90s. It's not... That, they've got to be minuted meetings as well. You'd think so, wouldn't you? Should we go and find them minutes? Let's, let's do this. Because I want to know what... I want to know... How I don't. I, I don't. Yeah, I oh. don't know if it's in the committee meeting or it might have been. Maybe pulled him outside. Like outside. Just can I have just a quick word, Graham? It's quite an interesting selection you've got here. So you've got um, it's quite a mm, diverse selection. They wouldn't have said diverse then. No, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't. They have, would have been. They might. I have think been, they'd have been so overtly you know what? racist. Let me see if I can find this. Um, I think they'd have been slang words and all sorts in there. Yeah, it might. It, it might have been. Um, I'm oh, trying to might see. have used that, that, that old colonial... Oh, yeah, I've actually found it. I bet. Right, so... I'd reckon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, words that we don't use that and we never think use. Is, they think is, is actually being PC by saying coloured, but yeah. actually it's incredibly it, offensive. It's quite offensive. It's like Gareth Keane on The Office. So, here it goes. <laughs> yeah, have you seen that? <laughs> what he's trying to say. We're not going to say it because we'll both get cancelled and I won't want to say it. But, yeah, if you ever get that chance to see I've that I've got one. it in my head, though. I know. <laughs> <laughs> mate, mate, unreal. Uh, this article is from 2015 from Daniel Taylor, our mate, friend of the channel. He's he, a good journalist. He does shit like this. Do you know what he's my favourite, probably my favourite interview? He's an actual journalist. Like, getting him on the channel was a big deal for me. I, I've let him play the blinder there, but because they've got a guy in the midst who's just going to do, he'll look into the sexual assault case stuff. He'll look into the, the money laundering stuff. He'll look into all the sports washing stuff. Yeah. He is a journalist. He's mint, isn't it? And like, he does it. When we had him on here. He don't go to press conferences. No, he ain't that guy. He ain't the guy ask about a quote. He don't talk goes. about transfers. You know where he, goes? he goes to the court cases when it's the sexual abuse scandal. He's at the court cases. He's like, become friendly with the victims. Tier one, tier one journalist. 100%. Like if you, if you was an aspiring journalist and you go, I'd like to work as a journalist, you go, who should I be? Should I be someone that works for a disreputable online blog, you know, formerly great local newspaper, or someone that actually does journalism? Yeah. And that is journalism. Because, was you here when we had him on? I've been in here when we've had him on. He's been on a few times, hasn't he? No, no, he's only been on once. Oh, and um, was and I, that was like a big, scoot. and it was good because it showed, I know what blow our own trumpet, but it showed that we were doing the right thing because he knew what we were. I chat to him pretty regularly. No, well, you've had him on, and you, but, on the paddock, we had him on once, and I've messaged him, and I've always got on with him. And I was like, "Will you come on?" And he went, "Oh yeah, I know what you guys are doing. Yeah, I'm happy to come on, which is good because it shows that you know the respect we're doing." So he comes on, and he's talking about the Barry Bennell case. He was covering that, and now City had like called him as a witness to try and stop these people getting um, compensation, which is just outrageous. And I don't know how that sort of almost got ignored by other, you know, journalists oh, right, no. in inverted commas. So we had him on. He was on for about an hour and twenty minutes. You know, he just flies by, and you think. We've just been chatting for ages. A lot of journalists, right? Being real, a lot of journalists are just people who rewrite press releases from people. Yeah, it's not even... It's not you're, you're glorified PR man. It is, it is. It's like an aggregator thing, and it? It's like, what's the quote? Who's got this story? And now they quote the, the other story, don't they? 
Because it's like, oh, as reported by the star, you know, said I was going to sign for Liverpool or whatever, so drivel. Yeah, he's a, he's a real journalist. Go on, right. sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you something in a minute. Um, yeah, so FA told Graham Taylor not to pick too many black players for England. There's no way they said it that PC. Yeah. Uh, exclusive new book claims FA tried to impose unofficial quota system. Um, there is no suggestion the former England manager adhered to the policy. And it just goes on to say that oh my God. Pitch Black, written by Emmy Onora, includes a passage in which an anti-racism anti in football campaigner claims Graham Taylor admitted to him he had been summoned by two members of the FA's hierarchy and told in no uncertain terms he should not go beyond a certain limit. Now, according, it goes on to say... I didn't know what's the limit. Like, well, that's it, it, doesn't matter, does it? But what, what's the limit? He's, so here it goes, it says. So this is the quote from the person that he spoke to. He says, I'm never going to admit I will be sued for libel. He said, when I was manager of England, I was called in by two members of the FA, who I won't name. I volunteered two names. He said, I'm not prepared to say, but I was told in no uncertain terms not to pick too many black players for the national side. I also want to make it clear here, there's no, like, from what we gather, Graham Taylor didn't listen to that. Well, the fact that Graham Taylor's telling people, yeah. I think shows and also, side of the fence he's uh, on. Yeah, it. and also, if you look at Graham Taylor, I mean, he was picking Carlton Palmer, for God's sake. It was not like he was... <laughs> like, like, it's not like if you've only got a quota, you're going to use that on Carlton Palmer. No disrespect to him, but come on, let's get real. So I, I don't think there's any evidence to support Graham Taylor being slightly racist or whatever. But yeah, that is outrageous that in the 90s, you've got the FA saying to the England manager, we'll give you, you can have three. I'm shocked I didn't know that. You can have three. Come I want another number. That, like, yeah. What, what, what are you going to do, right, if... As well, you're in a situation where you've got like Des Walker, Paul Ins, Ian Wright's banging him in, Les Ferdinand's banging him in. Do you know what I mean? You mean like you did? Yeah, like you did. Is this why Kevin Campbell's never had a cap? That's a good question. I, I wouldn't like to say that because I don't think Graham Taylor would be that guy. But Kevin Campbell, no English player has scored more top flight goals. And we had him sat there the other week. Uncapped. Than Kevin Campbell, and not got a cap. And you look at some of the dross. This is had caps. Just look at some of the fucking performances Kevin Campbell put in. Like, not an England fan. Yeah. But there's no way he shouldn't have been picked. Like, there's... And, like, even, like, latter-day Kevin Campbell when he went to Everton and just single-handedly saved them. He scored, like, 13 in 16. Yeah, he went alone like, there and literally scored 10 in he, 10. He, he scored nothing after that, like, when they signed him permanent. No, no, he, 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 yeah, <laughs> he, knew, he knew what he was doing. So Kev, though, is, like, he's not a goal-scoring striker. He's your target man. No. Because he has got a chest the size of this fucking table. He's a striker striker, isn't it? Like, he's the guy. Like, he's like a... a you play Michael Owen off him and yeah. watch what happens. Exactly. And you play Wayne Rooney off him at 16 look at, look, and watch what happens. Look at Heskey. Yeah. Heskey made a career at that. Has like, I don't know, about 50 England caps. Went to like four tournaments or whatever. And he wasn't as good as Kevin Campbell. No, no, no. I was, I was literally about to say, I know what you're saying. Like, they, they can both hold it up really well because they're both fucking big boys. Yeah. But fuck me. Yeah, you don't... You don't pick Heskey for the striking abilities that Kevin Campbell's got. Is Kevin Campbell a contender for like one of the most likable guys in football as well? He's amazing. He, he's just ace in it. Like as soon as he keeps walks in the room, he's like, hey, right, it's like so, your best mate. One of my what I lie to you is, is me and Kevin Campbell got to the semi final of the snooker tournament. <laughs> <laughs> as partners. <laughs> right, roll back, roll back. We've got to get him these cards. Can we get him these what I lie to you cards? Before that, I'm gonna do a little announcement in a minute, because producer in fact we'll stay the same. There's that. another one as well. Like so one of the first scoops I ever Sorry, had when I had him UFC like Right. One of the first scoops I had, we'd gone to see Kev. Yeah. There was this, uh, he was running a, like a football scouting kind of thing, because he lives in Manchester. And he was running this football scouting sort of thing. And he goes, uh, I'm chatting to him. And he's he's another one that I just get away, he gets away with calling me Steve. There's not many people do, but he's one. Well, to be uh, fair, he called Joe Jake for the first nice. half hour of our podcast. Steve. The, yeah. And it's like, <laughs> He, uh, he, was, he was talking about some of the stuff that was going on. There was a kid United bought on the day. Uh, and then I think they flipped him to West Ham and he never made a debut for either. So really? mad that. Um, but Gareth Bale's dad was there with his two, I think he's got twin younger brothers. They were there. Okay. And who else was there? Cesc Fabregas' agent was there. And Kev goes to me, you want to talk to him? And I went, do I? And he went, yeah, go and ask, go and ask him about Cesc. So I went and spoke to him and I said, I've been told to ask you about Cesc. And he goes, it'll be Manchester United. It'll be David Moyes' first signing for United. Sure. And I went, no way will I. And it was, this is, what, July or something of 2013? Yeah. And I was like, really? So we put it on our blog, um, got rinsed for it. And then, of course, when it turned out to be true, I mean, when a club never actually bothered their ass to sign him. <laughs> yeah, because we spent all summer trying to get him, didn't we? Yeah, Andy Merton sort of explained what happened. <clears throat> and Andy's such a good source in Spain that I think, 
as he wrote, as he wrote it, is probably fucking word for word what happened. Yeah, is that we bid one thing, they rejected it, which is like the natural fucking. But you get in, you get in an inc inclination. It's just you never accept the first offer. That, that they're open yeah. to this. They're not going. So we, we bid. Completely. You got to remember this is Woodward's first day on the job essentially yeah. as well. First transfer he's negotiated. So we, we we go for Fabregas. They back it away. United increased the bid. They back it away. And everybody expected a third bid to come. Woodward even fucking left Australia to go and do it, didn't he? Yeah. And he never did it. Why? That could, things could have been so different, you know. That one big signing. Well, his agent, that literally, summer. from his fucking mouth to that ear, said yeah. he will be his first signing. That's and I was like, wow, that. no way. Because he would have been such a good signing for us, and a big one, and someone you get a few years out of. And also, Woodward, he comes in and he goes, look, I'm delivering, rather than, I'm going to get your man on Flaney two days after he's... Buyout clauses ended. Imagine how different United would have been with fucking Fabregas instead of Fellaini. Don't, honestly. <sighs> right, we'll get into all that other stuff in a minute and we'll talk a little bit more about David Beckham because we've only spoke about him for two hours in the last two days, which is a disgrace. Anyway, fresh ball fall is upon us. Fresh ball fall, I'm not into that. It's It should be, what is it? What did we say? Sort of autumn. Sort of autumn. We had. What was it? Scrotum, decorum, autumn, I think, was the one that Joseph Smith came no. up with. But you're not having it. You're no. having sort of autumn. Even rhyme for starters. Sort of autumn's better, isn't it? Because scrotum, decorum, don't even rhyme. Not with autumn, anyway. Anyway, you need to be in a festive spirit. Light a candle, get some pumpkin spice, and make sure your balls look nice with the sponsors of today's show, Manscaped. Nature may clear the leaves off the trees, but you'll need Manscaped's help to get you ready for that sweater weather. So get your pants puppies prepared for cuffing season with a trim as refreshing as an autumn breeze by going to manscaped.com and using the code HOUSEN. I always say this to you, when you think of your balls, what you think is HOUSEN. For 20% off and free shipping, right? Because you want to join the 9 million men worldwide that use Manscaped. 9 million? 9 million, that's gone up so it was, much. It was 14 men when we started. Exactly, this. and thanks to us, it's now at 9 million because people have gone to it and realised there's no other way to go. Because let me ask you something today. Are you going to use a 3.0 trimmer? Do I look like I use a free? No, you don't, trimmer? bro. And nor should you, because you can get the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer with the advanced skin safe technology. You've got the crop, crop preserver, ball deodorant, and crop reviver, ball spray toner. You've got the Manscaped boxer briefs. You've got the shed travel bag. You get all that as this performance package. You get 20% off and free shipping. So you smell nice with like pumpkin spice. You look good. It's all clean. It's nice. Like the autumn leaves have fallen. Your piabs have fallen as well because you've shaved them off. You look the business. You smell the business. It's all in your little shed travel bag. You've got 20% off. You've got free shipping. You're joining 9 million other people, men, who know what's what. What more do you want? Click on a link in the description. Use the code Housen and your balls will thank look, you. Here's the thing. Fall. you got blokes in your life then you don't have a clue what to buy them. Yeah. What do I buy the man who's got everything? Ball trimmers. Exactly. Next question. Yeah. Fa my father-in-law, Christmas, ball trimmers. Yeah. Mother-in-law's never been so happy. So I'm going to say to you. Yeah. Go and check it out. Housing. Um, I forgot where we're up to. We were on about the racism in England team under Taylor, Ron Atkinson documentary, Beckham documentary. Where were we? I won a Oh, wait a minute. You in the you, you snooker tournament. Did we get there? Did we get to the I can't play snooker. So the tactics was, what I'll do is I'll do the ones where you just sort of like kiss another ball, do you want know, like hide behind something and basically snooker. Yeah. So they drop points on it or whatever. I don't fucking even know how it works. Your snooker knowledge is as good as mine. So this is like, this is the sort of conversation that two experts in snooker have gone. Yeah. So is it like, it's like pooling. Whatever it fucking is, yeah. where you just play a ball and I'm not potting because I don't have those capabilities. Yeah. Right. I'm just playing a ball, which means that the next time someone fucking goes and has a go, they ain't putting a ball either, and potentially like- She's snookering him? Yeah. Right, I like that. Yeah, because that's all I was capable of doing. Okay. Kev's the player. Is he good? He he, he was a professional footballer in a time before the internet. Do you know who's good at snooker? Before Tinder. Your mate's good at snooker. Les Brown. Is he? I met him in, Snor in short snorting. Short snooker old and nice. Yeah, and he's very good. I've heard a few that are low key good at snooker as well. But you're right. It's the working man's golf. Yeah, that era, like you said. Back in the day, what are you going to do? Well, do, do, you know, do you know why they were playing snooker? 
Because they were having fucking 12 ales as well. <laughs> That's why. That's why they weren't playing golf. Yeah. Golf like, is way more sophisticated. Yeah, you're not They're slaughtering yeah. fucking... Some seedy like... They're in the nag's head and yeah. it's got... It's 20p around, like, so... And that's what it was like. It stunk of smoke. Smoke, everyone smoked. You go in there, it was just like smoke bellowing out. And who's out of the back? Oh, White Side of Robber. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Mark, he was playing doubles. <laughs> so you got to see the semi-finals at snooker tournament with you not being able to play snooker? Correct. That is ace. Is another reason to love Kevin Campbell. Do you know who else was in that um, snooker tournament as well? Alex Higgins. No. Um, a very important uh, black Liverpool player. Howard Gale. You've interviewed him, haven't you? One of my, one of my favourite non-United interviews, because like, he went both barrels and he about everything. He was not holding back. And what he had to put up with was horrendous from his own teammates. Uh, some of the stuff I can't actually believe. No, I've read it <clears throat> and it is But didn't um, Tommy Smith say it? On telly or in the paper or something. Tommy Smith did an interview, and this is how racist. I don't think we can even say what. No, he said. no, no, we can't. Right? We can't. Well, we could. I don't even can allude to it. No. Go and Google Tommy Smith, and just go on his probably Wikipedia page. But basically, he did an interview, and it's like you know when Glenn Oddle did an interview, and like he, he got himself in trouble because he just went off on a tangent and started speaking about things that have nothing to do with football. Tommy Smith does an interview about his career when he's retired or whatever. And all of a sudden starts talking about how he wouldn't want his daughter to be, date a black person or whatever. But he, I'm using nice language compared to what he used. And the, the yeah, that, he, he, he took it to the, the worst place you could take. Yeah, and, and the interview's sort of going, oh my God. Like, I'm Full stop, is this next recording? paragraph. Yeah, right, okay. But because he's that racist, he doesn't think there's anything wrong in what he's saying. Well, it, it feels like he's like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, you know, one of that. He's not even doing the thing that... You know, like um, Bill Burr says, you know, when he always bumps into racists at buying hills because the guy will go. <laughs> like, because he, he thinks he's on the same page or whatever. He doesn't even do that, he's just like, full in. But then you look at what Howard Gale Yeah, he back. walks back into the change room. Where are we? Yeah. And it's like, and I like, I, you know what? There's, Howard Gale is proper on point because he said certain things like he wouldn't have put up with the nickname that John Barnes got because he thought it was too close to the bone. He thought some people were using that nickname because of obvious reasons and I think to go into that team and be the first one pretty much the first one through the through the gate it must be so hard because you're the one who's absorbing a lot of it you're the he one he had who's a lot to it. say about the Suarez uh, fallout and the way Liverpool handled it as a club was he, was he embarrassed no he was fuming fuming so even better yeah. and um, well he had the correct sort of take on it yeah. Which obviously isn't going to fly with Liverpool fans. No, no, because it was like they circled the wagons, didn't they? I, like, I don't know if he does any work with Liverpool anymore on the back end of that. And he should be. He should be the poster boy for Liverpool. He's the fucking club. hometown boy. Home, what was he? Nineteen. Nineteen played, played in the fucking like, Champions Europe, League final. finals and you know one of the. I think if, if not the. He's a good one. bloke, out here. I no, like him. I, I love that. I love the fact he was willing. A to be just be dead honest about it. B to go on, on a, a United a United podcast, podcast with, with someone who's well known for being a United fan. And just tell it as it is, not to be all tribal and go well, because John Barnes even yeah, went he won tribal, a tournament anyway. Sorry, he won a tournament. Well, I'm glad you know what. If you're gonna lose to anyone, <laughs> and if you're gonna lose to any scouser, <laughs> he's the one scouser that we can allow. Howard Gale is absolutely min. Uh, Peter Kelly says Pogba is tested positive for banned substances and failed his drug test. The only fair punishment is to strip all the titles from teams with 115 charges. Um, one thing I will want to say as well, Uncle Webb is not here today. Um, but he will be on Friday he ran me he's dead apologetic I said don't worry so he will be back next Friday I know a few of you have asked so don't worry you will get your fill of Webby because we need more of Webby's tales about Skip right and the like he's going to bring any this time or what but he's going to bring some stories this I time know he's a bit quiet anyway when he comes on air do you know bad. what I mean a bit beige doesn't tell us anything uh, Matt G says has it been said why LVG VO'd signing Tony Cruz no there's another one for you I'll ask him in my annual email to him I might, I might. Jay's not joking, by the way. No, I might increase it to every six months. I just don't want. All right, to I want to go over this. Though. So, which player or yeah. manager? Yeah. And you, I'm not giving you any A listers here. Okay. So, like a Ron Atkinson. Yeah. Because I think Ron Atkinson's a good B or C list, right? Um, I want to know which B or C list player because you can have your R9s, your Cruyffs, your Beckham. You know, they always get a documentary. But yeah. where, where's a good story? Like, because like Ron Atkinson is a, is a real. That's story. a good. You've you've mm -hmm. nailed it with that one. To be fair, yeah. that is a good because of what's gone on and the, the era and the achievements. Three trophies with three different English clubs. Up until did he sign Robbo as well? Yeah, you know, you know remember that you know better than anyone. I just, but I'm also thinking like eighty one was he there that early? Do you not know, remember the absolute 
world of the table we got out to sign the most expensive yeah. player in British football. Oh, by the way, so if you search Manchester United team photos in the 80s, sponsored by Sharp Electronics, <laughs> there's fucking fridges, there's ghetto blasters, there's <laughs> VCRs the size of this table, just on the grass. <laughs> I don't, like, it sounds mental, right? You're going, there's no fucking chance, D. Google them. But also, please take some time out to admire the coordination of matching your sky blue suit to your sky blue socks to your sky blue leather shoes that Ron Atkinson's pulled yeah. off because fuck me, did he not address? Is, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Is it that? Is it the relax? It's not a relax. It's a documentary. It's like, what's the one where he's in it a lot? I don't know what it, which one it is, but because there's one where he's in it a lot. That's because he's talking about when he goes to United and he, he's negotiating the car, and they say a Rover. We'll get you a Rover, and he says a Rover's a dog. I want a car. I want a Jag. <laughs> <laughs> that, I heard it in his voice yeah, and everything. That's what he says, and it's like that was his main concern. Not bothered about the team or the budget. Or what he's like a Donald Trump from Birmingham. He is, isn't it? It? Like that's that, that's yeah, his nice look. Well, he's a bit scouse, isn't he? Actually. Where's he actually from? Yeah, he's from he's from like he's a Wirral or something. Yeah, he's a, it's the a bit scouse. Warrington. Yeah, somewhere like that. Not quite scouse, but scouse enough to, you know. Where is where is Rikinson from? I'm gonna say Because it's northern, for sure. Yeah, no, I'm he is. I'm I, go on, you said the Wirral. I think you might have nailed no, it there. Hang on, I don't think it is the Wirral. I'm gonna say it's not it can't be that run card. Who do they play for? Oh, he's born in in old Swan area of Liverpool. So he's, he's full, actually fully fucking scouse. Yeah, but I think he's one of those where he's explains us something. He went to Wolverhampton, so that's the yeah when he was a that's a, kid. a softening of the accent. Yeah, and it? then he was at Oxford as a manager for BSA about. tools for a year. Kettering, let's just read them fucking list. Right, of so he went out. to Oxford as a player. Apparently, he was a bit of a bruiser. Uh, so then he goes to Kettering Town, yeah, as manager for two years. Does well there, obviously three years. Sorry, goes to Cambridge United. Absolute glory period in their history. They must have been like Division Four at the time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they were they were in the fourth division, but he won it for him. He took them up to the verge of the second division. Some teams in there, man. West Bromwich Albion. What? Yeah. Oh right, United, West Brom again, Atletico Madrid, <laughs> Sheffield Wednesday. Oh, he got a, he did us twice, didn't he? he? Did us with Wednesday when he beat us in the League Cup yeah. final. He did us with Villa. Uh, then he goes to Coventry City. Then he goes to Sheffield Wednesday. And then he goes to Nottingham Forest. Where he gets beat 8-1 off Manchester United when only got a social shot, scores four goals. <laughs> I mean, that is a documentary, that's the. You've peaked with that one, kid. We can't, I don't so go on, who, who, do you, who do you think? So it's a, like a B-lister type. It's where's the story? Because there's a story in Ron Atkinson. Uh, there's a hell of a story in Yeah, that's what I'm that's what And I'm it thinking, wouldn't be though. a labour of love doing it. Like, if you give me Cantona or R9 no, or something like that, I'm going to pour my heart and soul into it. Atkinson's going to be so surprising at times that it'd be. I think it'd be genuinely interesting. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a, there's a good story there. But so who's your B-lister? Who are you doing? Who are you go where everyone goes, really? But actually, the more you think about it, oh, that's fucking genius. It's difficult, that. Because there's there's ones I'd watch. And we actually saw him, I think. Um, coming back from Wembley. Viv Anderson would be a good one. Yeah, Viv Anderson, first Black England player. Yeah, won the won the European Cup twice. Played under Clough and Fergie. Yeah, Fergie's first Fergie's ever signing. First ever signing. Shockey European Biden. Cup winner. Yeah, there's an interesting one. And a, if you meet him, a decent bloke as well. Like, I like Viv Anderson. Yeah, nice bloke. Got a story to tell. Like again, first through the gate, took a lot of flack, and and a career that didn't always go the way he wanted it to. Like I remember at one point, United he was getting hammered by the fans, and then he turned it around. Ends up, I think, Sheffield Wednesday yeah. converts um, into a different type of player. So yeah, there's an interesting one for me, just because if I'm thinking, what would I want to watch? I think, okay, what's it like being like the first ever? Black he's player? he's quite chill about it because obviously I had to ask him that when we interviewed him. And uh, was it Laurie Cunningham? Yes, God rest him. Him, he said basically, me and Laurie Cunningham was both in and around the squad. Is it going to be him or is it going to be me? And it was me. And that's literally his whole like undramatic sort of. Um, oh, I know who it is. It. You've just made me think. Oh, I'd, I'd have because you made me think about Laurie Cunningham and explain my thinking here. Made me think about Cyril Regis. It made me think about when he passed away, Dion Dublin crying about it, which was really moving. Dion Dublin is a documentary. 
and I will tell you. I why. don't think it's quite Ron Atkinson levels. No, and, uh, but the music but side of stuff. He he invented a musical instrument, Steve. The dupe. That doesn't happen. Name me one other footballer in the history of football that has invented a musical instrument. Name um, me one. Maradona liked to bugle. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't invent it, he just took it to another Oh yeah, level. sorry, yeah. made it he famous. It, he, he just did it better than anyone else. That's a great <laughs> shout, yeah. Love that. <laughs> um, but no, like, Dion Dublin, Homer's under the hammer, inventing musical instruments, getting his big money move to United and breaking his leg within a month. Like, there's a story there. Going up, breaking From the Cambridge? Answer. From Cambridge, like, and also another guy who's quite charismatic, is like quite likable, and has a, there's something about him where you, you, you know if you chat to him, you enjoy spending time with him. I think that's an interesting one. If you're going to go down the B or C list, because he's not A list, and I get that. Yeah, and that's what I think makes it interesting. Like I'd love a Cantona one, like a, a like a Last Dance style Cantona where does, one. Where does Mark Hughes fit in this? Because he'd be an interesting one. The fact he played for Wales and Bayern Munich in one fucking day alone yeah. is the centerpiece of your documentary. Yeah. But yeah, a Manchester United Academy product who ends up managing City through the transition into the fucking what it is now. sports washing shit they do now. Well said. Um, played for Bayern Munich, played for Barcelona. Yeah. Won the fucking lot. Yeah. Biggest thighs known to man. And also scorer like, of the fucking goals in the greatest um, achievement in the history of association football. What do you want? Do you know what I mean? Like, he'd be a good one. And he's a... a he's not at work as well. What? He's not yeah. at work as well. Yeah, exactly. we got to get him on a brew. We are. I don't know anyone who knows him. We had someone. Oh, and he's well. Surely Ash knows. Come on. There's only about five you know Welsh everyone. footballers. You, I've seen pictures with like you and Figo and R9 and all that. Mark Hughes probably lives in Cheshire. He does, don't he? Like, if I had to guess, where does Mark Hughes live? What, I, I could probably he's... narrow it down to three postcodes. WA16. Yeah, yeah. Right. You, I think you nailed it in the first one, to be honest with you. Um, what do you reckon he's like? Do you reckon he's all right, Mark Hughes? Sometimes I think I He worry. comes across as dry. Yeah. I, would, I think Mark Hughes, you might have to take him out for a few beers first, then bring him in. Because <laughs> sometimes I've seen him where I think he doesn't suffer. For, but but saying that, we'd get him on and just be like, I feel like tell Ash us how been, great you are. Just text Ash while we're you, text, you text Ashley Williams. Say, well, I'm going to go through some of the comments and the I'm chat. Just as put, well. Did you play under Mark Hughes? Um, Jed's, Jed's dead, baby. Says, Are you guys going to record the live show? We will have bits of the live show available to watch. We'll say available, like we're releasing them in book bookstores. They'll be on the channel. But if you don't know about our live show, we're going to be coming to Dublin on the 28th of December. Me, him, Maka, Joe, and John O'Shea. And Mark Hughes. And Mark Hughes. <laughs> John and Mark Hughes, yeah. <laughs> Steve's going to continue his drinking session with Mark Hughes all the way to Dublin. That's an achievement, mate. If you can drink with an 80s United player, your Premier League... Haven't you done it? I mean, yeah, I have, but like... And you're still there. Because I told you about the time with Norman Whiteside, didn't I? Yeah, I think everyone's got a white side on the pistol. My, my missus lasted half an hour. Because I don't drink. So she was sat drinking. Oh, he like, finished me off? Yeah. He finished me off and carried on going. Yeah. And left us with a £400 wine bill. I mean, can, you know, that's the biggest schoolboy ever, 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 in it? Did you think he was going to pick up that tap, did you? <laughs> <laughs> and you got away with like 400 Just quid. for wine. Just for wine, yeah. yeah. Drink with anyone that's like. My missus switched to lemonades after that. She's like, I can't. Cause Don't drink with anyone who's doing wine. It was him and D, you know, his missus, and they were like, and obviously I would drink. She was like, I can't. I'm like, after half an hour, I can't do anything. And the thing and is, what, he, he stayed he, like on the same yeah, level. He didn't he, drunk. He attacks it uh, like a fucking 17 year old on the first night out early doors. Yeah. Like, not, he's not, he doesn't, he doesn't ease into the night. Like, I did an interview with Robbo, right? And he did like f four bottles of Bud in the half an hour I did the interview. And he's, I'm like, what the fuck? Mate. Like, Robbo just hit, like, a pace. Yeah. Like, just a nice sort of... It was like a tennis match with Robbo. Just, he's just fucking batting it back and forward, whereas... Do you know what would be good? And we could do this, I think. We should get Chucky and Mark Hughes to go Jockey's probably got the keys. I think do you know what I'm thinking? Who's I got the keys to... Who's yeah. got Mark Hughes' number? Uh, yeah, probably his fucking partner up front yeah. for how many and years. And also, Chucky has that ability. He did it with Andy Cole. I don't know, I was with once. He'll bring him, he brings it out of them. He reminds them of stuff. Well, that's, how many of them, you sit them down here and they go interview mode. Yeah. But then you bring Chucky in, yeah. who has got like a, a 12th damn black belt in sarcasm. Yeah, 100%. Like, I actually can't fully understand what he's saying sometimes because it's so <laughs> wrapped in sarcasms and like, like honestly, metaphors. I'd, my first ever Q&A Q &A that I ever did with anyone 
was with Chucky, right? And this is before I knew him. And me being deaf as well, he's, mate, he's no, very mate, softly you're, you're spoken. Yeah. What? Yeah, what? honestly, it's what? horrible, isn't it? It's the accent. Yeah. It's the fact he's generally really mm. mumbly a bit with it. Yeah, and he sto- and then he stops, doesn't it? Because he did it with me. We did a Q&A in a beer, in a beer killer, wherever it was, in town. It's ran full of Scandinavians. They're being a bit loud. Not disrespectful, but they're like, yeah, and all that, right? I was struggling <laughs> with him. He's been drinking all day, and he's telling these stories, and then I'm listening... And I don't know these stories at the time because I just met him. Now I do, I know him off like, the back of my hand. And then he stops talking. You're like, oh shit, am I supposed to speak now? Yeah, was that serious? Was that a joke? I'm a metal laugh. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I didn't know what to do, so it was, it was dodgy. But he's Could been... Could be a good doc? I've often thought that. Because think about it. Top score at Celtic, won the league there, smashes it. Fergie basically, I don't see him, got United, I want you. Do you know what I mean? The relationship we had with Fergie was unique because he was one of the few players in history that's ever been sort of able to give Fergie I mean, shit. even what he did post-career in being the academy director at United. Yeah, yeah. Like, look, you know, help. Do you know what, though? There aren't a lot of controversies with Chucky. He's, he's pretty... He's, like, very professional. He is pretty professional, like, he is. And like, Weirdly for a gobshite, because he's a gobshite. I, I can smell a gobshite, and he's definitely a gobshite. Like, this is, this is what... I, I've not spoke to him in months, right, or in a little while. First of all, he messaged me the other day, he says, I'm in town tomorrow, are you about... I say, yeah, he don't reply. <laughs> right? <laughs> then I get... Nice just one. wondering. Just I wonder, wonder, I didn't I want to come down her out, but... Then I get another message off from him on Wednesday. Hi, Judas. It's his nickname for me. We used to work together and I moved, so he calls me Judas. Do you remember what them what the woolly hats based in the United kit were called? So, see, I'm a chocky, and I sent him a link to it. He said, thanks. That's it. That's our conversation last month. He just wanted to know what them woolly hats were. Rocco, you know them Rocco... Thingy. Yeah, that, that's it. He wanted to know what they were called because, you know, he doesn't use Google, just ask me. And that's it. So, yeah, we'll get him on with Mark Hughes. That's gold. Do you know what I mean? I want to do... Because he can do these things, man. These are doable. I want to do a drunk watch along of mm-hmm. the 1991 Cup Winners' Cup final right. with as many of the living members of that as possible. Even Clayton Blackmore? Yeah, Clayton Blackmore, Lee Sharp, Mark Hughes, <laughs> Chucky. Jesus Christ, eh? you're gonna Gary do, Pallister. You're going to be doing more than drinking with them lot. Robbo. Yeah. Mike Phelan. Come on. Like, be, even if that cost us. That'd be. A I'd, lot we, of we, money. Could, we could happily bank, bank up the channel for that. <laughs> do you know what I'm paying it. this month? Or yeah. can we do this? Yeah. We can, we can make content <laughs> on stream yeah, in our bedrooms. We've done it before. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Do you remember COVID? Like, that would be mint. Did you see the, the. This is why we need to do more of these things as well. We'll just. Who's just go. got a replica Cup Winners Cup trophy? Because there's some sad old going, yeah, I've got one. We can get one out. I don't know where we can get one. <laughs> well, that might be the one, isn't it? Is that the one? <laughs> <Get on away. laughs> Just don't break it, right? No, I'll, I'll be shut out of the family group chat. <laughs> <laughs> is that actually one of the ones, or was it a replica? I don't know, but I reckon we can. We might be able to borrow it if we play our cards right. We'll see. Um, take some photos of it. Yeah, take some photos. We'll give it back. <laughs> you know what I mean? It'll be all right. We'll when, when have they used it last? Exactly. Is Come it even on. on display? I don't know. Probably not nowadays. Do you know what I mean? They're probably embarrassed. Um, now, we can make it happen. <laughs> I think we can get them together. Did you, did you see the interview with Lee Sharp? This is what I mean about certain United players. Course. Yeah, and he did like an hour and a half interview. And the amount of stories he's got because of that era. I don't know how under the cosh tease the shit out of them that they do. I think, I think it's one of those where, and it's a similar thing with Andy Cole. If you get him and you go, look, we'll just have a chat for however long you want to talk about your career. Under the cosh with Lee Sharp, if you've not seen it, it's genuinely good because he goes into a lot of, he didn't have a great relationship with Fergie. No. And I think he pushed Fergie's buttons. Yeah. Um, but uh, Fergie's ruthless. Some of that, though, I did feel sorry for Lee Sharp because I thought, like, you've just scored at Everton and the manager comes steaming on at the coach and has a go at you for how you celebrated. And you're 19 years old and you've just scored the winner. Like, that's insane. But he was very, like, you're not getting too big for your boots, which we've seen a little bit in the Beckham documentary. But that bit will he shout when he says send, send his girlfriend back to Birmingham? About to Can you imagine King. doing that now? Yeah. Sell your dog, move your move out your house and yeah. fuck your bird off. Yeah. And he does. Like that's crazy. Like, but Lee Sharp was great because and it's funny as long as he goes, oh, tell me dad, my dad's like, well fucking do it then. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when he rang he rang his mum or something, didn't he? And said, like, oh, I think you need to have a word about your son. And she was like, that's your job. Yeah. <laughs> like, you don't live here anymore. Well, I think he's a bit popular with the girls in Manchester. Basically, he was doing fucking oh, absolute Champions League level shagging. Like, I think, yeah, he was like the first. 
big superstar. Listen, we're going to wrap it up anyway because I know it's time is getting on. Uh, thanks to everyone who got in the. Um... Ash says nah. <laughs> when was that? When was Mike Hughes Wales manager then? Because it felt like it was fairly recent. He must know. He must know someone. Mark Hughes. Well, yeah, you've nailed it. Chucky will have Mark Hughes' number. Chucky, yeah. Chucky's got everyone's number. And I think they get on. I don't think there's ever been an issue. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, I don't know why I did it that way. Um, yeah, 2004. No. Oh, because he was later, wasn't he? Ask William. Same as me. Really? Was well, a year younger. Yeah, because he didn't play. He played quite late in his career, didn't he? Not mega late. No, oh, but he probably just slipped under the radar. Because he was. He wouldn't have been as a teenager. More well still known. playing fucking like Stockport. Safe Stockport didn't he? His transfer from what a Stockport fan told me not long ago. Um, yeah, we'll get on to Chucky. We'll get Mark Hughes on here because Mark Hughes and Chucky on here, and we'll just do a ninety minute or ninety five. Let me see the comments. Let's see what everyone's saying. Go on. Uh, would we take Ethan along to film it? Take him where? We're doing I it think, here. No, I think I, I don't know if that's the live show or. Yordi Cruyff? No, nah, I don't think so. I think with Yordi Cruyff, it's a bit of a. It's a funny one because his career at United isn't that big and also a big part of him, him, is who your dad was. And it's a bit naff going, tell us about your dad. Tony mm. says Chucky was a real player. Uh, Acorn says McClure. What are you laughing at? Eh? Why are we getting laughing from the cheap seats there? Eh? Um, what are you laughing at there, Eve? Mm. Something funny. Uh, what? Sighing. Sighing. Uh, you beat PSG and you think you beat a big spuds. Amaya says, good thing about the Beckstock was Gary Neville giving him props for actually being mint. Yeah. Um, Phil Jones, don't think so. Phil Jones. Um, yeah, Ross says Mark Hughes is available now. He got sacked at Bradford. Yeah. Uh, Acorn says Hughes is an A-list hero legend. It probably should be, really. Yeah, I, I, I get that. When that's what that was my question to you when you said about BC. I thought I was going a bit too good. But the problem is, Mark Hughes is an interesting enough story, and if you looked at it as a neutral, he's A. Yeah. But as a United fan. His behaviour and the fact he went and managed City. I never felt once he left United, Sparky there was love for United. No, no. I never got it. I never got it in any. It's way. like he's as miserable as Roy Keane. Yeah. Without the reason, like Roy Keane is miserable because it, there's a bitterness I think with yeah, Roy Keane, yeah. and there's a standard in Roy Keane. Whereas it feels like Mike Hughes never liked us. Yeah. And that can't be the case for a guy that grew up here. I feel like almost United it was a means to an end in terms of. You've come through, you're from Wrexham or wherever, we've scouted you, you're in the team. As soon as you break in and that team and start doing well, you leave or you, you sign a contract yeah. with Barcelona. Could he go to Wrexham? Sorry? Could he go to Wrexham? Oh, there's a documentary. Boy song. coming home. Is he not too a bit too old school though for that to matter to the, Maybe, younger, yeah. to the younger fans who they're appealing to? Bringing in a 60 year old is probably like, what? He, used to, he, what, he grew up here when? Mm. Look at the shorts. Short shorts. Mate, those are decent then. Hey, that's ledge. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I think um, I think we need to make this happen. We can do it. We can do it. Like, this is going to happen. We'll get on to Chucky and make it happen. Uh, talk and make things happen. What's going on with you this weekend? We're in cup action tomorrow. Oh, cup. Who are you playing? Denton. There, but G- gaffer of yours. Is that theirs? Are they any good? Doesn't matter. We're going to twat them. That's what I like to hear. Um, wait a minute. Is Ronaldo Brown still suspended? Right, good, he's on the watch along with me. <laughs> so when well, you said cup, I thought you were going to say no because it's a cup of four, as he forgot. Uh, that's why I was checking no, out. Well. he's fucking suspended the melon. Yeah, because, uh, well, I think that was arse, that. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I think it was arse, to I'm be not honest. Gonna, I'm not going to lie to you. But you're not allowed to grip another fucking player by the shirt no more. Exactly. Game's gone. He's not that type of player, Steve. Hey, remember that. Where well, is that type of player? It's not his first red card. <laughs> It was his 50th, was it his 50th appearance? Yeah. And he wanted to mark it with something <laughs> memorable, right? He couldn't get a goal, so he got the next best thing, a red card. And he knew his manager would have his back, which you have done. So there you go. He, he, he did well. It's content. Um, right, so me, Ronnie, I think Joe Smith's going to be here, but he's a bit poorly sick, so you might see him in the uh, Ronnie... Uh, swapping places but we're going to be here for a watch along uh, Steve's going to be at Denton playing them in the cup so go and check out Strip for Paddock FC and Stephen House on TV make sure as well you are subscribing to the channel big thank you to Manscaped for sponsoring the podcast check out as well the event we've got on the 28th of December in Dublin I think that's it for me see you later Steve thanks for watching <laughs>